Oh, good morning, good morning. How are you? Derek Watson, the angry dentist. A rainy day in paradise, another one. Been uh, raining hard all night, so. All the uh, uh, rain that we're supposed to have had in April, we're having in May. So, uh, you know, you get it, sooner or later. Everything that's coming to you, comes to you. Things are doing well. It's a uh, oh, I don't know what day it is. No way. It says, my, th my watch says it's Thursday, but I don't, <laughs> I can't be Thursday. I know we didn't work Monday. Tuesday and Wednesday were really busy. Thursday I've just got crown preps. Perhaps it is Thursday. Oh my God. It's Thursday already, okay, fine, Thursday. It's Thursday the 4th of May. My birthday's coming up, I'm a Taurus. I'm under a lot of pressure from my children to sort of suggest any presents, you know. Presents for birthday, presents for Father's Day. That's the trouble, it's Father's Day and my birthday very close together. So anything up to a fiver, they don't mind. They're pretty generous, my kids. They don't mind splashing out. So, uh, mind you, I mean, what do you need? What do you need, honestly? I say to them every year, all I want you to do is just come over and perhaps, you know, bring the bring the kids, just spend a day chilling out. That's all I want for Father's Day. That's all I want for my birthday. I don't need anything. What do I need? I got some clothes, I got a pair of spectacles, I've got a car, I've got a purpose in life. I've got several purposes in life. <laughs> but I've got about a hundred purposes in life. I wouldn't mind a few less purposes in life. That's true. If someone could just find a way of subtracting a few, perhaps if I could swap... What do they want to do? You know those TV programmes where they get people together like rich people and poor people so they can look, at the, look on the poor people's faces when they realise how much rich people have got and you no know, money to spend. And, uh, and the rich people are also gracious about living on baked beans. <laughs> they ought to have a thing where they've got like someone like me and a Trustafarian who, you know, is on cocaine and just hangs out in coffee shops all day. Uh, and uh, we could swap purposes. I could just give them like a ton of my purposes and I could just have offload of, a load of purpose. And, and perhaps for a day or two just live like I didn't have a care in the world and I've got nobody to support and nobody flying on me. Wouldn't that be lovely? Wouldn't that be lovely? The trouble with um, the trouble with having people relying on you is that I mean it's it's great in a way that you can support because you can make so many things happen that wouldn't happen otherwise. Uh, you know you can help people do things that they, they couldn't do um, including get a job <laughs> this is you I'm talking to, my staff. I've given you a job. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, it all builds up, doesn't it? There's a backlog. Like you go on holiday, and I mean, holiday is just a change of location, isn't it? It's, it's not really. It's like if you're a hygienist, okay? Now, it's my hygienist always used to tell me this, and people would say, oh, you know. If, Instead of coming in every three months, can I come in every six months? These were in the days before we did a lot of prevention and nobody had any scale. And, um, and the hygienist used to say, well, you know, you're not really saving anything because in six months time, all that's gonna happen is you'll have twice as much scale on your teeth and I'll have to take it all off anyway. So why, uh, you know, what's, it's not like stretching out your appointments is gonna save you anything because we'll just have to charge you twice as much when you come in half as frequently. And I think uh, responsibilities like that, you know, they never go away. They just pile up a bit if you take a few days off from them. Anyway, we're going to have a staff meeting today. We're going to, uh, it's April and April is a time of renewal, isn't it? All the, uh, the trees are green, the grass is riz. I wonder where the bodies is. And uh, it's time to put your fees up. And you should put your fees up unless you should put them down. By which I mean generally you should put your fees up, and but, but you have to look at them all individually and say, you know, 
is like implants for example <clears throat> cost of implants has come down a lot we've just completed the 2017-18 fees guide so it's going to be going out to everybody who uh, participated in that unfortunately not every year fewer and fewer people participate which is a shame I don't know whether it's because people are more confident setting their own fees now or they don't need to look at uh, and dentistry magazine is a, oh, is a terrible plagiarist for these sort of things. Anything, anything that uh, anyone does that you know has got any sort of traction, the dentistry magazine will steal. You know, <laughs> they've got. We, we do uh, the GDPR has always done the industry standard private fees guide, and it's based on an actual survey of fees. But of course, uh, you know, other people are free to do their own surveys, but they tend not to be quite so accurate because they are they're more so a consumer I mean you know like they might ring up a dentist and say how much you charge or can you send me a copy of your fee guide the fee thing is not really worked very well I've got to say I know which was you know the magazine well, it, was, it is a magazine basically but you know they set themselves up as a consumer's champion who decided to um, bring were well, given license to bring the first super complaint to the Office of Fair Trading. Now, in case you didn't know, a super complaint is a complaint that the Office of Fair Trading has to consider, has to take action on. So, for example, if you and I, if you or I complained about the monopoly on dental supplies, you know, given that like only like two or three companies, shell companies, own every dental supplier in the UK, so that you know there's no real competition, and therefore we we're all paying like 150 pounds a gram. <laughs> something <laughs> then the office of fair trade would look at that and say mm, yeah okay yeah okay well I don't know there's not much you know you're not you're not making a good enough case there's not that much evidence of collusion and you know and, you know these materials are are expensive and it's a small market etc so we're not we're not going to do anything about it but which we're told that whatever they complained about would be actioned you know and they were the first body to be given the status of a super complainant. And what was the first super complaint that they made? Dentistry. The dentistry, dentistry at the time had something like 20,000 individual dentists working from 8,000 different dental practices. That it was somehow a monopoly and uh, not transparent and ripping off the consumers. And, and of course it wasn't, it was just a, you know, it was just a government it was a government sponsored move to try and deregulate the dental profession to uh, reduce the cost of the NHS so you know along comes Harry Caton and with his stupid three band scheme but um, the the one thing they said was that everybody had to do uh, you know publish the fees because that's part of the free market. The free market is basically based on information. The, the theory, free market theory, states that every fact, every material fact, should be priced into the market and to the cost of things. So, you know, for example, if um, I don't know if if something's going to happen, if something like you know, if, if the if the crop has failed, then the price of wheat goes up in anticipation because people know the crop has failed and so they're able to adjust what they'll pay for wheat as a result. However, if some, if only one person knows the crop has failed and nobody else does, they'll carry on, uh, you know, paying, uh, paying low rates for wheat. And uh, this other person will buy up all the wheat at low rates, knowing that he can then sell it later at higher rates. And this is sort of arbitrage, buying something cheaply and selling it higher is arbitrage. And it's based on informational asymmetry. In other words, one person knowing something that the market doesn't know. And the markets hate that. <laughs> they absolutely hate the idea that someone's got the inside track, you know. And uh, they go, you know, insider dealing, for example, is, you know, where where an officer of a company or some, you know, someone who's in, or a printer who's in receipt of a, of a, a report, you know, showing good profits or bad profits or something, who, who deals in shares in advance of the announcement. To the market is jumped upon from a very great height. So, which said that the dental market was operating on an asymmetric basis, and also that there was no um, portability, in that you know you couldn't really have a 
a treatment plan and uh, dentist A and take it to dentist B or, 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 or actually more accurately hawk it around dentist B, C, D, E and F and say look dentist A has given me this prescription um, can you do it cheaper you know which would be competition and funnily enough it's not I mean it's competition that dentists wouldn't really object to I, I don't think any dentist seriously objects to that nor does any dentist seriously think that's ever going to happen because you don't, you know, it's not like, uh, they, they, they borrowed this from the optical sector where the idea was that you could go and get a prescription from an optician, but you then didn't have to have your glasses made at that optician. And in, in the same way as uh, the, the, the abuse in the um, uh, in retirement funds where you'd save, uh, you'd save all your life with a particular company and then you would then be forced to buy an annuity, which is an income generating policy from the same company. The idea was that you know you should, once your uh, once your annuity matures, once your um, pension pot you know fund matures, that you should be free to say, well, okay, I'm I'm going to be forced to buy an annuity with this because they won't let you. Uh, they won't let you take your pension pot to Las Vegas for some reason, <laughs> some some weird reason. Um, you know, you have to buy an annuity so that the, the government forces you to have some sort of income in old age. But the problem was that by being forced to buy it from the people you'd saved with, that you were going to automatically get a bad deal because they were. And then why should they? Why should they offer you a good deal? You know, it's the law. You have to buy it from us. It's the law. I don't care. I don't care how much we're ripping you off. Um, you know, it just goes to reinforce that any sort of involvement of the public sector and government in free markets always always involves things being done worse than they would be otherwise so anyway the idea was that your pension pot then became portable and your spectacles prescription became portable and you could go to Tesco's and then uh, take your prescription to uh, boots or spec savers or whatever and say look what's the best deal you can give me on the pair of glasses to this prescription and uh, you know, and I suppose in theory that might work with spectacles because you've got a prescription, haven't you? I mean, it's a couple of numbers, isn't it, each eye? And uh, they're pretty uh, objective as well. They're not really that subjective. The problem with dentistry is you go to a dentist and uh, you go and see 10 dentists and you'll get 12 different opinions. And this idea that the public can make any sense of what goes on in dentistry is, is romantic, to be honest with you. I mean, we had a... At the time that uh, which were gathering evidence for their super complaint, they um, they did a uh, anonymous survey, you know, like a secret shopper type survey of dentist fees, and um, they sent someone into our surgery. I was working in Canterbury at the time, and reception said to me, "You've got to come down here. There's someone, someone in the waiting room. I think you need to have a chat with." And so, uh, so and there was this young girl, and she was there with. Um, <laughs> she had like a hat on and big sunglasses and a scarf like she was dressed up like a sort of celeb going out in public you know and like she was in disguise you know she was obviously in disguise. the only thing she didn't have was a false moustache so immediately she she looked odd and then she said to me I'd like to know how much um, you know you charge for a checkup this is before the days when you know our fees were on the website so I said oh well okay uh, you know this is what we charge for checkup oh and how much and does that include x-rays because there was a big thing about you know uh, a hidden fee is it, uh, are x-rays a hidden fee no they don't charge for x-rays oh and I think I need a crown how much would a crown be so, so by then I'm like thinking oh god this is she's a mystery shopper she said because they don't want to they want to save time they don't want to come in and have a checkup because they know that they're not they don't need what they need to know the prices of so they just have to come in but rather than just ring up and say look I need to know what you're charging for X Y and Z because the dentists were a bit cagey about that because at that time that those sort of fees were quite jealously protected because um, you know the only people that were likely to ring up and find out and ask what your fees were were other dentists receptionists who would who wanted to um, find out what you're charging so they could charge a bit less so if you're charging 300 pound for a crown you know and they said how much you charge for a crown you say 300 pound so then they would go back and say oh, oh what's he up the road he's charging 300 uh, so let's charge 290 
and then when the patient says how much are your crowns you can say they're 290 but I know for a fact if you go up the road to Wati he's charging 300 and the patient said alright then I'll, I'll have it done with you so we were sort of pretty close to the chest about our fees but um, nowadays of course everyone puts you know from 10 pounds <laughs> And the, but the fact is the patient still has to come in and have the checkup, and that's what you know puts the kibosh on it because you, you go you see a, a dentist you get a particular <clears throat> point of view which fits in with that dentist's point of view he might one dentist might say yeah a lot of your crowns are quite old and need replacing another dentist might say well your crowns may be old but they're they're okay you know let's just leave you know and let do do you know perhaps just that root treatment that I've spotted because I did a, a periopical x-ray whereas the other dentist only did bite wings. It's, you know, it, it's so variable and it doesn't mean that, you know, there's no, there's no real definitive treatment plan. The GDC found this out when the sort of patients' complaints come to the GDC and they're, they're sort of, they're trying to say, well, look, let's, let's get an expert in, let's get an expert in. And he will tell us, where, you know, whether the dentist treatment plan was accurate, whether he's trying to do too much, or whether he missed something and didn't do enough, didn't do the right thing. But then, what happens is they get in some expert, you know, with academic expert, who's who's in absolutely no condition at all to say what would be done in general practice. And you're not being judged against your peers at that point. You're being judged against some academic who's, you know, who's only interested in. An, the sort of treatment plan that will be given to a patient by a consultant in a teaching hospital. So, oh, anyway, all oh, uh, fees need to be reset in April. So, what we're going to do? There are there are some interesting things about the fees. Some some things have uh, are coming down, and other things are going up. Um, so, if you uh, responded to the survey, then we will be sending that round, and then. We're going to have to decide what to do about the uh, fee guide with respect to the, the large number of dentists who are really not interested in it, you know, who, who weren't, or at least weren't interested enough to sort of contribute towards it. And um, um, we may make a small charge for it just to help with the running costs of the association, just as some nominal charge. Uh, but, um, and also, DEM plan or DPAS or practice plan, or they're probably all AXA now. Um, you know, you have to adjust those fees as well because um, you know, expenses go up. Dental inflation is not zero. Uh, general inflation is 2%. So what we've done is, I mean, typically our band C patient pays, used to pay £24.50 or something and we've put it up to 24 96 That's a tip actually, if you're on them, if you've got a sort of a capitation scheme, it's always a good idea to end everything in 99. I'm a, I'm a big fan of 99. I think um, it's underrated. I know people think it's a bit of a sort of a marketing, cheap a cheap marketing trick or, you know, some people say that it was originally designed because, um, you know, when people paid in cash, if you made something for 99, then, then if the purchaser gave five pounds to the person on the till, they would have to put it in the till because they and give a receipt because then they have to give a penny change. So that penny was the uh, anti-theft protection because then it's much easier for someone just to put the fiver in their pocket and for the for the customer you know, to forget that they hadn't got a receipt or not realise that they hadn't been given a receipt. But 99 is great. I think, you know, something that's 100... I mean, like we do um, Smile Line, which is like orthodontic straighteners, and the recommended price for those is two fifty uh, an aligner. But I think two forty nine is just better, you know, it just more acceptable. And nowadays, the computers do all the maths, so it's not like you know you, you're um, forcing your receptionist to add up a load of dot ninety eights and something ninety nines and things like that. Although you can do that quite easily in your head. Um, so what we've done is we've put, I think we've put all our, our third party capitation fees up to dot 99. So, you know, and 24.56 to 24.99 is, is not a, you know, it just like, it doesn't sound like a massive 
increase at all. Also, when you're putting up fees for the capitation, don't forget that, look at the distribution of your patients on the bands. You'll find that you've got a few on A and one or two on E, and then a few more on B and, and, and D, but the vast majority will be on C. So, you know, putting like a pound on at the A rate will, will bring you in nothing. But putting uh, 20 pence on the C rate will bring you on in far more. And, and still, you know, appear to the patients to be much less. So <clears throat> what I'll do, when I get to work, I'm going to send out the uh, private fees guides. And uh, if you haven't got one and you want one, then uh, get in touch with the association. And uh, we'll see what we can do. All right. Lovely. Nice to talk to you. I'll uh, see you tomorrow. Bye.